Story nine of Around the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine The Lost Special. The confession of Herbert de Lernac, now lying under sentence of death at Marseilles, has thrown a light upon one of the most inexplicable crimes of the century an incident which is i believe absolutely unprecedented in the criminal annals of any country although there is a reluctance to discuss the matter in official circles and little information has been given to the press there are still indications that the statement of this arch-criminal is corroborated by the facts and that we have at last found a solution for a most astonishing business as the matter is eight years old and as its importance was somewhat obscured by a political crisis which was engaging the public attention at the time it may be as well to state the facts as far as we have been able to ascertain them they are collated from the liverpool papers of that date from the proceedings at the inquest upon john slater the engine driver and from the records of the london and west coast railway company which have been courteously put at my disposal briefly they are as follows on the third of june eighteen ninety a gentleman who gave his name as monsieur louis caratal desired an interview with mr james bland the superintendent of the london and west coast central station in liverpool he was a small man middle-aged and dark with a stoop which was so marked that it suggested some deformity of the spine he was accompanied by a friend a man of imposing physique whose deferential manner and constant attention showed that his position was one of dependence this friend or companion whose name did not transpire was certainly a foreigner and probably from his swarthy complexion either a spaniard or a south american one peculiarity was observed in him he carried in his left hand a small black leather dispatch box and it was noticed by a sharp-eyed clerk in the central office that this box was fastened to his wrist by a strap no importance was attached to the fact at the time but subsequent events endowed it with some significance m caritel was shown up to mr bland's office while his companion remained outside m caritel's business was quickly dispatched he had arrived that afternoon from central america affairs of the utmost importance demanded that he should be in paris without the loss of an unnecessary hour he had missed the london express a special must be provided money was of no importance time was everything if the company would speed him on his way they might make their own terms mr bland struck the electric bell summoned mr potter hood the traffic manager and had the matter arranged in five minutes the train would start in three-quarters of an hour it would take that time to ensure that the line should be clear the powerful engine called rochdale number two forty seven on the company's register was attached to two carriages with a guard van behind the first carriage was solely for the purpose of decreasing the inconvenience arising from the oscillation the second was divided as usual into four compartments a first class a first class smoking a second class and a second class smoking the first compartment which was nearest to the engine was the one allotted to the travellers the other three were empty the guard of the special train was james mcpherson who had been some years in the service of the company the stoker william smith was a new hand m caritel upon leaving the superintendent's office rejoined his companion and both of them manifested extreme impatience to be off having paid the money asked which amounted to fifty pounds five shillings at the usual special rate of five shillings a mile they demanded to be shown the carriage and at once took their seats in it although they were assured that the better part of an hour must elapse before the line could be cleared in the meantime a singular coincidence had occurred in the office which m caritel had just quitted a request for a special is not a very uncommon circumstance in a rich commercial centre but that two should be required upon the same afternoon was most unusual 
It so happened, however, that Mr. Bland had hardly dismissed the first traveller before a second entered with a similar request. This was a Mr. Horace Moore, a gentlemanly man of military appearance, who alleged that the sudden serious illness of his wife in London made it absolutely imperative that he should not lose an instant in starting upon the journey. His distress and anxiety were so evident that Mr. Bland did all that was possible to meet his wishes. A second special was out of the question, as the ordinary local service was already somewhat deranged by the first. There was the alternative, however, that Mr. Moore should share the expense of Monsieur Caritel's train, and should travel in the other empty first-class compartment, if Monsieur Caritel objected to having him in the one which he occupied. It was difficult to see any objection to such an arrangement, and yet Monsieur Caritel, upon the suggestion being made to him by Mr. Potter Hood, absolutely refused to consider it for an instant. The train was his, he said, and he would insist upon the exclusive use of it. All argument failed to overcome his ungracious objections, and finally the plan had to be abandoned. Mr. Horace Moore left the station in great distress, after learning that his only course was to take the ordinary slow train, which leaves Liverpool at six o'clock. At 4.31, exactly by the station clock, the special train, containing the crippled Monsieur Caritel and his gigantic companion, steamed out of the Liverpool station. The line was at that time clear, and there should have been no stoppage before Manchester. The trains of the London and West Coast Railway run over the lines of another company as far as this town, which should have been reached by the special rather before six o'clock. At a quarter after six, considerable surprise and some consternation were caused among the officials at Liverpool by the receipt of a telegram from Manchester to say that it had not yet arrived. An inquiry directed to St. Helens, which is a third of the way between the two cities, elicited the following reply. To James Bland, Superintendent, Central L&WC, Liverpool, special passed here at 4.52, well up to time, Dowser, St. Helens. This telegram was received at 6.40. At 6.50, a second message was received from Manchester. No sign of special as advised by you. And then, ten minutes later, a third, more bewildering presume some mistake as to proposed running of special local train from st helens time to follow it has just arrived and has seen nothing of it kindly wire advices manchester the matter was assuming a most amazing aspect although in some respects the last telegram was a relief to the authorities at liverpool if an accident had occurred to the special, it seemed hardly possible that the local train could have passed down the same line without observing it. And yet, what was the alternative? Where could the train be? Had it possibly been sidetracked for some reason in order to allow the slower train to go past? Such an explanation was possible if some small repair had to be effected. A telegram was dispatched to each of the stations between St. Helens and Manchester, and the superintendent and traffic manager waited in the utmost suspense at the instrument for the series of replies which would enable them to say for certain what had become of the missing train. The answers came back in the order of questions, which was the order of the stations beginning at the St. Helens end. Special passed here five o'clock, Collins, Green, Special passed here, six past five, Earlstown. Special passed here at five ten, Newton. Special passed here, five twenty, Kenyon Junction. No special train has passed here, Barton Moss. The two officials stared at each other in amazement. This is unique in my thirty years of experience, said Mr. Bland. Absolutely unprecedented and inexplicable, sir. The special has gone wrong between Kenyon Junction and Barton Moss. And yet there is no siding, so far as my memory serves me, between the two stations. The special must have run off the rails. But how could the 450 parliamentary pass over the same line without observing it? There's no alternative, Mr. Hood. It must be so. 
possibly the local train may have observed something which may throw some light upon the matter we will wire to manchester for more information and to kenyon junction with instructions that the line be examined instantly as far as barton moss the answer from manchester came within a few minutes no news of missing special driver and guard of slow train positive no accident between kenyon junction and barton moss line quite clear and no sign of anything unusual manchester that driver and guard will have to go said mr bland grimly there has been a wreck and they have missed it the special has obviously run off the metals without disturbing the line how it could have done so passes my comprehension but so it must be and we shall have a wire from kenyon or barton moss presently to say that they have found her at the bottom of an embankment but mr bland's prophecy was not destined to be fulfilled half an hour passed and then there arrived the following message from the station master of kenyon junction there are no traces of the missing special it is quite certain that she passed here and that she did not arrive at barton moss we have detached engine from goods train and i have myself ridden down the line and all is clear and there is no sign of any accident mr bland tore his hair in his perplexity this is rank lunacy hood he cried does a train vanish into thin air in england in broad daylight the thing is preposterous an engine a tender two carriages a van five human beings and all lost on a straight line of railway unless we get something positive within the next hour i'll take inspector collins and go down myself and then at last something positive did occur it took the shape of another telegram from kenyon junction regret to report that the dead body of john slater driver of the special train has just been found among the gorse bushes at a point two and a quarter miles from the junction had fallen from his engine pitched down the embankment and rolled among bushes injuries to his head from the fall appear to be cause of death ground has now been carefully examined and there is no trace of the missing train the country was as has been already stated in the throes of a political crisis and the attention of the public was further distracted by the important and sensational developments in paris where a huge scandal threatened to destroy the government and to wreck the reputations of many of the leading men in france the papers were full of these events and the singular disappearance of the special train attracted less attention than would have been the case in more peaceful times the grotesque nature of the event helped to detract from its importance for the papers were disinclined to believe the facts as reported to them more than one of the london journals treated the matter as an ingenious hoax until the coroner's inquest upon the unfortunate driver an inquest which elicited nothing of importance convinced them of the tragedy of the incident mr bland accompanied by inspector collins the senior detective officer in the service of the company was sent down to kenyon junction the same evening and their research lasted throughout the following day but was attended with purely negative results not only was no trace found of the missing train but no conjecture could be put forward which could possibly explain the facts at the same time inspector collins official report which lies before me as i write served to show that the possibilities were more numerous than might have been expected in the stretch of railway between these two points said he the country is dotted with ironworks and collieries of these some are being worked and some have been abandoned there are no fewer than twelve which have small gauge lines which run trolley cars down to the main line these can of course be disregarded besides these however there are seven which have or have had proper lines running down and connecting with points to the main line so as to convey their produce from the mouth of the mine to the great centres of distribution in every case these lines are only a few miles in length out of the seven four belong to collieries which are worked out or at least to shafts which are no longer used these are the red gauntlet hero slew of despond and heart's ease mines the latter having ten years ago been one of the principal mines in lancashire 
these four side lines may be eliminated from our inquiry for to prevent possible accidents the rails nearest to the main line have been taken up and there is no longer any connection there remain three other side lines leading a to the carnstock ironworks b to the big ben colliery c to the perseverance colliery of these the big ben line is not more than a quarter of a mile long and ends at a dead wall of coal waiting removal from the mouth of the mine nothing had been seen or heard there of any special the carnstock ironworks line was blocked all day upon the third of june by sixteen truckloads of hematite it is a single line and nothing could have passed as to the perseverance line it is a large double line which does a considerable traffic for the output of the mine is very large on the third of june this traffic proceeded as usual hundreds of men including a gang of railway plate layers were working along the two miles and a quarter which constitute the total length of the line and it is inconceivable that an unexpected train could have come down there without attracting universal attention it may be remarked in conclusion that this branch line is nearer to st helens than the point at which the engine driver was discovered so that we have every reason to believe that the train was past that point before misfortune overtook her as to john slater there is no clue to be gathered from his appearance or injuries we can only say that so far as we can see he met his end by falling off his engine though why he fell or what became of the engine after his fall is a question upon which i do not feel qualified to offer an opinion in conclusion the inspector offered his resignation to the board being much nettled by an accusation of incompetence in the london papers a month elapsed during which both the police and the company prosecuted their inquiries without the slightest success a reward was offered and a pardon promised in case of crime but they were both unclaimed every day the public opened their papers with the conviction that so grotesque a mystery would at last be solved but week after week passed by and a solution remained as far off as ever in broad daylight upon a june afternoon in the most thickly inhabited portion of england a train with its occupants had disappeared as completely as if some master of subtle chemistry had volatilized it into gas indeed among the various conjectures which were put forward in the public press there were some which seriously asserted that supernatural or at least preternatural agencies had been at work and that the deformed monsieur caritale was probably a person who was better known under a less polite name others fixed upon his swarthy companion as being the author of the mischief but what it was exactly which he had done could never be clearly formulated in words amongst the many suggestions put forward by various newspapers or private individuals there were one or two which were feasible enough to attract the attention of the public one which appeared in the times over the signature of an amateur reasoner of some celebrity at that date attempted to deal with the matter in a critical and semi-scientific manner an extract must suffice although the curious can see the whole letter in the issue of the third of july it is one of the elementary principles of practical reasoning he remarked that when the impossible has been eliminated the residuum however improbable must contain the truth it is certain that the train left kenyon junction it is certain that it did not reach barton moss it is in the highest degree unlikely but still possible that it may have taken one of the seven available side lines it is obviously impossible for a train to run where there are no rails and therefore we may reduce our improbables to the three open lines namely the carnstock ironworks the big ben and the perseverance is there a secret society of colliers an english camorra which is capable of destroying both train and passengers it is improbable but it is not impossible i confess that i am unable to suggest any other solution i should certainly advise the company to direct all their energies towards the observation of those three lines and of the workmen at the end of them 
a careful supervision of the pawnbrokers' shops of the district might possibly bring some suggestive facts to light. The suggestion coming from a recognized authority upon such matters created considerable interest, and a fierce opposition from those who considered such a statement to be a preposterous libel upon an honest and deserving set of men. The only answer to this criticism was a challenge to the objectors to lay any more feasible explanation before the public. In reply to this, two others were forthcoming, Times, July 7th and 9th. The first suggested that the train might have run off the metals and be lying submerged in the Lancashire and Staffordshire Canal, which runs parallel to the railway for some hundreds of yards. This suggestion was thrown out of court by the published depth of the canal, which was entirely insufficient to conceal so large an object. The second correspondent wrote, calling attention to the bag which appeared to be the sole luggage which the travellers had brought with them, and suggesting that some novel explosive of immense and pulverizing power might have been concealed in it. The obvious absurdity, however, of supposing that the whole train might be blown to dust while the metals remain uninjured reduced any such explanation to a farce. The investigation had drifted into this hopeless position when a new and most unexpected incident occurred. This was nothing less than the receipt by Mrs. McPherson of a letter from her husband, James McPherson, who had been the guard of the missing train. The letter, which was dated July 5, 1890, was posted from New York and came to hand upon July 14th some doubts were expressed as to its genuine character but mrs mcpherson was positive as to the writing and the fact that it contained a remittance of a hundred dollars in five dollar notes was enough in itself to discount the idea of a hoax no address was given in the letter which ran in this way my dear wife i have been thinking a great deal and i find it very hard to give you up the same with lizzie I try to fight against it, but it will always come back to me. I send you some money which will change into twenty English pounds. This should be enough to bring both Lizzie and you across the Atlantic, and you will find the Hamburg boats, which stop at Southampton, very good boats and cheaper than Liverpool. If you could come here and stop at the Johnston house, I would try and send you word how to meet but things are very difficult with me at present, and I am not very happy, finding it hard to give you both up. So no more at present from your loving husband, James McPherson. For a time it was confidently anticipated that this letter would lead to the clearing up of the whole matter, the more so as it was ascertained that a passenger who bore a close resemblance to the missing guard had travelled from Southampton under the name of Summers in the Hamburg and New York liner Vistula, which started upon the 7th of June. Mrs. McPherson and her sister Lizzie Dalton went across to New York as directed, and stayed for three weeks at the Johnston house without hearing anything from the missing man it is probable that some injudicious comments in the press may have warned him that the police were using them as a bait however this may be it is certain that he neither wrote nor came and the women were eventually compelled to return to liverpool and so the matter stood and has continued to stand up to the present year of eighteen ninety eight incredible as it may seem nothing has transpired during these eight years which has shed the least light upon the extraordinary disappearance of the special train which contained m caretal and his companion careful inquiries into the antecedents of the two travellers have only established the fact that m caretal was well known as a financier and political agent in central america and that during his voyage to europe he had betrayed extraordinary anxiety to reach paris his companion whose name was entered upon the passenger list as eduardo gomez was a man whose record was a violent one and whose reputation was that of a bravo and a bully there was evidence to show however that he was honestly devoted to the interests of m caretal and that the latter being a man of puny physique employed the other as a guard and protector 
It may be added that no information came from Paris as to what the object of Monsieur Caratal's hurried journey may have been. This comprises all the facts of the case up to the publication in the Marseilles papers of the recent confession of Herbert de Lernac, now under sentence of death, for the murder of a merchant named Bonvalot. This statement may be literally translated as follows. It is not out of mere pride or boasting that I give this information, for if that were my object I could tell a dozen actions of mine which are quite as splendid. But I do it in order that certain gentlemen in Paris may understand that I, who am able here to tell about the fate of Monsieur Caritel, can also tell in whose interest and at whose request the deed was done, unless the reprieve which I am awaiting comes to me very quickly. Take warning, messieurs, before it is too late. You know Herbert de Lagnac, and you are aware that his deeds are as ready as his words. Hasten, then, or you are lost. At present I shall mention no names. If you only heard the names, what would you think? But I shall merely tell you how cleverly I did it. I was true to my employers then, and no doubt they will be true to me now. I hope so, and until I am convinced that they have betrayed me, these names which would convulse Europe shall not be divulged, but on that day, well, I say no more. In a word, then, there was a famous trial in Paris in the year 1890 in connection with a monstrous scandal in politics and finance. How monstrous that scandal was can never be known save by such confidential agents as myself. The honor and careers of many of the chief men in France were at stake. You have seen a group of ninepins standing, all so rigid and prim and unbending. Then there comes the ball from far away, and pop, 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 there are your ninepins on the floor. Well, imagine some of the greatest men in France as these ninepins, and then this Monsieur Caritel was the ball which could be seen coming from far away. If he arrived, then it was pop-pop-pop for all of them. It was determined that he should not arrive. I do not accuse them all of being conscious of what was to happen. There were, as I have said, great financial as well as political interests at stake, and a syndicate was formed to manage the business. Some subscribed to the syndicate, who hardly understood what were its objects. But others understood very well, and they can rely upon it that I have not forgotten their names. They had ample warning that Monsieur Caritel was coming long before he left South America, and they knew that the evidence which he held would certainly mean ruin to all of them. The syndicate had the command of an unlimited amount of money, absolutely unlimited, you understand. They looked round for an agent who was capable of wielding this gigantic power. The man chosen must be inventive, resolute, adaptive, a man in a million. They chose Hébert de Lanac, and I admit that they were right. My duties were to choose my subordinates, to use freely the power which money gives, and to make certain that Monsieur Caritel should never arrive in Paris. With characteristic energy I set about my commission within an hour of receiving my instructions, and the steps which I took were the very best for the purpose which could possibly be devised. A man whom I could trust was dispatched instantly to South America to travel home with Monsieur Caritel. Had he arrived in time, the ship would never have reached Liverpool, but alas, it had already started before my agent could reach it. I fitted out a small armed brig to intercept it, but again I was unfortunate. Like all great organizers, I was, however, prepared for failure, and had a series of alternatives prepared one or the other of which must succeed. You must not underrate the difficulties of my undertaking, or imagine that a mere commonplace assassination would meet the case. We must destroy not only M. Caritel, but M. Caritel's documents, and M. Caritel's companion also, if we had reason to believe that he had communicated his secrets to them and you must remember that they were on the alert and keenly suspicious of any such attempt it was a task which was in every way worthy of me for i am always most masterful where another would be appalled 
I was all ready for Monsieur Caratal's reception in Liverpool, and I was the more eager because I had reason to believe that he had made arrangements by which he would have a considerable guard from the moment that he arrived in London. Anything which was to be done must be done between the moment of his setting foot upon the Liverpool quay and that of his arrival at the London and West Coast terminus in London. We prepared six plans, each more elaborate than the last, which plan would be used would depend upon his own movements. Do what he would, we were ready for him. If he had stayed in Liverpool, we were ready. If he took an ordinary train, an express or a special, all was ready. Everything had been foreseen and provided for. You may imagine that I could not do all this myself. What could I know of the English railway lines? But money can procure willing agents all the world over, and I soon had one of the acutest brains in England to assist me. I will mention no names, but it would be unjust to claim all the credit for myself. My English ally was worthy of such an alliance. He knew the London and West Coast line thoroughly, and he had the command of a band of workers who were trustworthy and intelligent. The idea was his, and my own judgment was only required in the details. We bought over several officials, amongst whom the most important was James McPherson, whom we had ascertained to be the guard most likely to be employed upon a special train. Smith, the stoker, was also in our employ. John Slater, the engine driver, had been approached, but had been found to be obstinate and dangerous, so we desisted. We had no certainty that M. Caritel would take a special, but we thought it very probable, for it was of the utmost importance to him, that he should reach Paris without delay. It was for this contingency, therefore, that we made special preparations, preparations which were complete down to the last detail, long before his steamer had sighted the shores of England. You will be amused to learn that there was one of my agents in the pilot boat which brought that steamer to its moorings. The moment that Caritel arrived in Liverpool, we knew that he suspected danger and was on his guard. He had brought with him as an escort a dangerous fellow named Gomez, a man who carried weapons and was prepared to use them. This fellow carried Caritel's confidential papers for him, and was ready to protect either them or his master. The probability was that Caritel had taken him into his counsels, and that to remove Caritel without removing Gomez would be a mere waste of energy. It was necessary that they should be involved in a common fate, and our plans to that end were much facilitated by their request for a special train. On that special train you will understand that two out of the three servants of the company were really in our employ, at a price which would make them independent for a lifetime. I do not go so far as to say that the English are more honest than any other nation, but I have found them more expensive to buy. I have already spoken of my English agent, who is a man with a considerable future before him, unless some complaint of the throat carries him off before his time. He had charge of all arrangements at Liverpool, whilst I was stationed at the inn at Kenyon, where I awaited a cipher signal to act. When the special was arranged for, my agent instantly telegraphed to me, and warned me how soon I should have everything ready. He himself, under the name of Horace Moore, applied immediately for a special also, in the hope that he would be sent down with M. Caritel, which might under certain circumstances have been helpful to us. If, for example, our great coup had failed, it would then have become the duty of my agent to have shot them both and destroyed their papers. Caritel was on his guard, however, and refused to admit any other traveller my agent then left the station returned by another entrance entered the guard's van on the side farthest from the platform and travelled down with mcpherson the guard in the meantime you will be interested to know what my movements were everything had been prepared for days before and only the finishing touches were needed the side line which we had chosen had once joined the main line but it had been disconnected we had only to replace a few rails to connect it once more. 
These rails had been laid down as far as could be done without danger of attracting attention, and now it was merely a case of completing a juncture with the line and arranging the points as they had been before. The sleepers had never been removed, and the rails, fish plates, and rivets were all ready, for we had taken them from a siding on the abandoned portion of the line. With my small but competent band of workers, we had everything ready long before the special arrived. When it did arrive, it ran off upon the small side line so easily that the jolting of the points appears to have been entirely unnoticed by the two travelers. Our plan had been that Smith the stoker should chloroform John Slater the driver, so that he should vanish with the others. In this respect, and in this respect only, our plans miscarried. I accept the criminal folly of McPherson in writing home to his wife. Our stoker did his business so clumsily that Slater in his struggles fell off the engine and though fortune was with us so far that he broke his neck in the fall, still he remained as a blot upon that which would otherwise have been one of those complete masterpieces which are only to be contemplated in silent admiration. The criminal expert will find in John Slater the one flaw in all our admirable combinations. A man who has had as many triumphs as I can afford to be frank, and I therefore lay my finger upon John Slater, and I proclaim him to be a flaw. But now I have got our special train upon the small line two kilometers, or rather used to lead to the abandoned Heart's Ease mine, once one of the largest coal mines in England you will ask how it is that no one saw the train upon this unused line i answer that along its entire length it runs through a deep cutting and that unless someone had been on the edge of that cutting he could not have seen it there was someone on the edge of that cutting i was there and now i will tell you what i saw my assistant had remained at the points in order that he might superintend the switching off of the train he had four armed men with him, so that if the train ran off the line, we thought it probable, because the points were very rusty, we might still have resources to fall back upon. Having once seen it safely on the sideline, he handed over the responsibility to me. I was waiting at a point which overlooks the mouth of the mine, and I was also armed, as were my two companions come what might you see i was always ready the moment that the train was fairly on the side line smith the stoker slowed down the engine and then having turned it on to the fullest speed again he and mcpherson with my english lieutenant sprang off before it was too late it may be that it was this slowing down which first attracted the attention of the travellers, but the train was running at full speed again before their heads appeared at the open window. It makes me smile to think how bewildered they must have been. Picture to yourself your own feelings, if, on looking out of your luxurious carriage, you suddenly perceive that the lines upon which you ran were rusted and corroded, red and yellow, with disuse and decay what a catch must have come in their breath as in a second it flashed upon them that it was not manchester but death which was waiting for them at the end of that sinister line but the train was running with frantic speed rolling and rocking over the rotten line while the wheels made a frightful screaming sound upon the rusted surface i was close to them and could see their faces Caritaal was praying, I think. There was something like a rosary dangling out of his hand. The other roared like a bull who smells the blood of the slaughterhouse. He saw us standing on the bank, and he beckoned to us like a madman. Then he tore at his wrist and threw his dispatch box out of the window in our direction. Of course his meaning was obvious. Here was the evidence, and they would promise to be silent if their lives were spared. It would have been very agreeable if we could have done so, but business is business. Besides, the train was now as much beyond our control as theirs. He ceased howling when the train rattled round the curb, and they saw the black mouth of the mine yawning before them. 
we had removed the boards which had covered it and we had cleared the square entrance the rails had formerly run very close to the shaft for the convenience of loading the coal and we had only to add two or three lengths of rail in order to lead them to the very brink of the shaft in fact as the lengths would not quite fit our line projected about three feet over the edge we saw the two heads at the window caritao below gomez above but they had both been struck silent by what they saw and yet they could not withdraw their heads the sight seemed to have paralyzed them i had wondered how the train running at a great speed would take the pit into which i had guided it and i was much interested in watching it one of my colleagues thought that it would actually jump it and indeed it was not very far from doing so fortunately however it fell short and the buffers of the engine struck the other lip of the shaft with a tremendous crash the funnel flew off into the air the tender carriages and van were all smashed up into one jumble which with the remains of the engine choked for a minute or so the mouth of the pit then something gave way in the middle and the whole mass of green iron smoking coals brass fittings wheels woodwork and cushions all crumbled together and crashed down into the mine we heard the rattle 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 as the debris struck against the walls and then quite a long time afterwards there came a deep roar as the remains of the train struck the bottom the boiler may have burst for a sharp crash came after the roar and then a dense cloud of steam and smoke swirled up out of the black depths falling in a spray as thick as rain all around us then the vapor shredded off into thin wisps which floated away in the summer sunshine and all was quiet again in the heartsease mine and now having carried out our plan so successfully it only remained to leave no trace behind us our little band of workers had at the other end already ripped up the rails and disconnected the side-line replacing everything as it had been before we were equally busy at the mine the funnel and other fragments were thrown in the shaft was planked over as it used to be and the lines which led to it were torn up and taken away then without flurry but without delay we all made our way out of the country most of us to paris my english colleague to manchester and macpherson to southampton whence he emigrated to america let the english papers of that day tell how thoroughly we had done our work and how completely we had thrown the cleverest of their detectives off our track you will remember that gomez threw his bag of papers out of the window and i need not say that i secured that bag and brought them to my employers it may interest my employers now however to learn that out of that bag i took one or two little papers as a souvenir of the occasion i have no wish to publish these papers but still it is every man for himself in this world and what else can i do if my friends will not come to my aid when i want them messieurs you may believe that herbert de lagnac is quite as formidable when he is against you as when he is with you and that he is not a man to go to the guillotine until he has seen that every one of you is en route to new caledonia for your own sake if not for mine make haste monsieur de blank and general blank and baron blank you may fill up the blanks for yourselves as you read this i promise you that in the next edition there will be no blanks to fill p s as i look over my statement there is only one omission which i can see it concerns the unfortunate man macpherson who was foolish enough to write to his wife and to make an appointment with her in new york it can be imagined that when interests like ours were at stake we could not leave them to the chance of whether a man in that class of life would or would not give away his secrets to a woman having once broken his oath by writing to his wife we could not trust him any more we took steps therefore to ensure that he should not see his wife i have sometimes thought that it would be a kindness to write to her and to assure her that there is no impediment to her marrying again end of story nine
Story ten of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story ten The Club Footed Grocer my uncle mr stephen maple had been at the same time the most successful and the least respectable of our family so that we hardly knew whether to take credit for his wealth or to feel ashamed of his position he had as a matter of fact established a large grocery in stepney which did a curious mixed business not always as we had heard of a very savoury character with the riverside and seafaring people he was ship's chandler provision merchant and if rumour spoke truly some other things as well such a trade however lucrative had its drawbacks as was evident when after twenty years of prosperity he was savagely assaulted by one of his customers and left for dead with three smashed ribs and a broken leg which mended so badly that it remained forever three inches shorter than the other this incident seemed not unnaturally to disgust him with his surroundings for after the trial in which his assailant was condemned to fifteen years penal servitude he retired from his business and settled in a lonely part of the north of england whence until that morning we had never once heard of him not even at the death of my father who was his only brother my mother read his letter aloud to me if your son is with you ellen and if he is as stout a lad as he promised for when last i heard from you then send him up to me by the first train after this comes to hand he will find that to serve me will pay him better than the engineering and if i pass away though thank god there is no reason to complain as to my health you will see that i have not forgotten my brother's son congleton is the station and then a drive of four miles to greta house where i am now living i will send a trap to meet the seven o'clock train for it is the only one which stops here mind that you send him ellen for i have very strong reasons for wishing him to be with me let bygones be bygones if there has been anything between us in the past if you should fail me now you will live to regret it we were seated at either side of the breakfast table looking blankly at each other and wondering what this might mean when there came a ring at the bell and the maid walked in with a telegram it was from uncle stephen on no account let john get out at congleton said the message he will find trap waiting seven o'clock evening train steddington bridge one station further down line let him drive not me but garth farmhouse six miles there will receive instructions do not fail only you to look to this is true enough said my mother as far as i know your uncle has not a friend in the world nor has he ever deserved one he has always been a hard man in his dealings and he held back his money from your father at a time when a few pounds would have saved him from ruin why should i send my only son to serve him now but my own inclinations were all for the adventure if i have him for a friend he can help me in my profession i argued taking my mother upon her weakest side i have never known him to help any one yet said she bitterly and why all this mystery about getting out at a distant station and driving to the wrong address he has got himself into some trouble and he wishes us to get him out of it when he has used us he will throw us aside as he has done before your father might have been living now if he had only helped him but at last my arguments prevailed for as i pointed out we had much to gain and little to lose and why should we the poorest members of a family go out of our way to offend the rich one my bag was packed and my cab at the door when there came a second telegram good shooting let john bring gun remember steading bridge not congleton and so with a gun case added to my luggage and some surprise at my uncle's insistence i started off upon my adventure the journey lies over the main northern railway as far as the station of carnfield where one changes for the little branch line which winds over the fells in all england there is no harsher or more impressive scenery for two hours i passed through desolate rolling plains rising at places into low stone littered hills with long straight outcrops of jagged rock showing upon their surface 
Here and there little grey-roofed, grey-walled cottages huddled into villages, but for many miles at a time no house was visible, nor any sign of life save the scattered sheep which wandered over the mountainside. It was a depressing country, and my heart grew heavier and heavier as I neared my journey's end, until at last the train pulled up at the little village of Steading Bridge, where my uncle had told me to alight. A single ramshackle trap with a country lout to drive it was waiting at the station. "'Is this Mr. Stephen Maples?' I asked. The fellow looked at me with eyes which were full of suspicion. "'What is your name?' he asked, speaking a dialect which I will not attempt to reproduce. "'John Maple.' "'Anything to prove it?' I half raised my hand, for my temper is none of the best, and then I reflected that the fellow was probably only carrying out the directions of my uncle. For answer I pointed to my name printed upon my gun-case. "'Yes, yes, that is right. It's John Maple, sure enough,' said he, slowly spelling it out. "'Get in, Meister, for we have a bit of a drive before us.' The road, white and shining like all the roads in that limestone country, ran in long sweeps over the fells, with low walls of loose stone upon either side of it. The huge moors, mottled with sheep and with boulders, rolled away in gradually ascending curves to the misty skyline. In one place a fall of the land gave a glimpse of a grey angle of distant sea. Bleak and sad and stern were all my surroundings, and I felt, under their influence, that this curious mission of mine was a more serious thing than it had appeared when viewed from London. This sudden call for help from an uncle whom I had never seen, and of whom I had heard little that was good, the urgency of it, his reference to my physical powers, the excuse by which he had ensured that I should bring a weapon, all hung together and pointed to some vague but sinister meaning. Things which appeared to be impossible in Kensington became very probable upon these wild and isolated hillsides. At last, oppressed with my own dark thoughts, I turned to my companion with the intention of asking some questions about my uncle, but the expression upon his face drove the idea from my head. He was not looking at his old unclipped chestnut horse, nor at the road along which he was driving, but his face was turned in my direction, and he was staring past me with an expression of curiosity, and, as I thought, of apprehension. He raised the whip to lash the horse, and then dropped it again, as if convinced that it was useless. At the same time, following the direction of his gaze, I saw what it was which had excited him. A man was running across the moor. He ran clumsily, stumbling and slipping among the stones, but the road curved and it was easy for him to cut us off. As we came up to the spot for which he had been making, he scrambled over the stone wall and stood waiting with the evening sun shining on his brown, clean-shaven face. He was a burly fellow and in bad condition, for he stood with his hand on his ribs, panting and blowing after his short run. As we drove up, I saw the glint of earrings in his ears. "'Say, mate, where are you bound for?' he asked in a rough but good-humoured fashion. "'Farmer Purcell's at the Garth Farm,' said the driver. "'Sorry to stop you,' cried the other, standing aside. "'I thought as I would hail you as you passed, for if so be as you had been going my way, I should have made bold to ask you for a passage.' His excuse was an absurd one, since it was evident that our little trap was as full as it could be, but my driver did not seem disposed to argue. He drove on without a word, and, looking back, I could see the stranger sitting by the roadside and cramming tobacco into his pipe. "'A sailor,' said I. "'Yes, maister, we're not more than a few miles from Morecambe Bay,' the driver remarked. "'You seemed frightened of him,' I observed. "'Did I?' said he dryly, and then after a long pause, maybe I was. As for his reasons for fear, I could get nothing from him, and though I asked him many questions, he was so stupid, or else so clever, that I could learn nothing from his replies. I observed, however, that from time to time he swept the moors with a troubled eye, but their huge brown expanse was unbroken by any moving figure. At last, in a sort of cleft in the hills in front of us, I saw a long, low-lying farm building, the centre of all those scattered flocks. 
garth farm said my driver there's farmer purcell himself he added as a man strolled out of the porch and stood waiting for our arrival he advanced as i descended from the trap a hard weather-worn fellow with light blue eyes and hair and beard like sun-bleached grass in his expression i read the same surly ill-will which i had already observed in my driver their malevolence could not be directed towards a complete stranger like myself and so i began to suspect that my uncle was no more popular on the north country fells than he had been in stepney highway you're to stay here till nightfall that's mr stephen maple's wish said he curtly you can have some tea and bacon if you like it's the best we can give you i was very hungry and accepted the hospitality in spite of the churlish tone in which it was offered the farmer's wife and his two daughters came into the sitting-room during the meal and i was aware of a certain curiosity with which they regarded me it may have been that a young man was a rarity in this wilderness or it may be that my attempts at conversation won their good will but they all three showed a kindliness in their manner it was getting dark so i remarked that it was time for me to be pushing on to greta house you've made up your mind to go then said the older woman certainly i have come all the way from london there's no one hindering you from going back there but i have come to see mr maple my uncle oh well no one can stop you if you want to go on said the woman and became silent as her husband entered the room with every fresh incident i felt that i was moving in an atmosphere of mystery and peril and yet it was all so intangible and so vague that i could not guess where my danger lay i should have asked the farmer's wife point-blank but her surly husband seemed to divine the sympathy which she felt for me and never again left us together it's time you were going mister said he at last as his wife lit the lamp upon the table is the trap ready you'll need no trap you'll walk said he how shall i know the way william will go with you william was the youth who had driven me up from the station he was waiting at the door and he shouldered my gun case and bag i stayed behind to thank the farmer for his hospitality but he would have none of it i ask no thanks for mr stephen maple nor any friend of his said he bluntly i'm paid for what i do if i was not paid i would not do it go your way young man and say no more he turned rudely on his heel and re-entered his house slamming the door behind him it was quite dark outside with heavy black clouds drifting slowly across the sky once clear of the farm enclosure and out in the moor i should have been hopelessly lost if it had not been for my guide who walked in front of me along narrow sheep tracks which were quite invisible to me every now and then without seeing anything we heard the clumsy scuffling of the creatures in the darkness at first my guide walked swiftly and carelessly but gradually his pace slowed down until at last he was going very slowly and stealthily like the one who walks light-footed amid imminent menace this vague inexplicable sense of danger in the midst of the loneliness of that vast moor was more daunting than any evident peril could be and i had begun to press him as to what it was that he feared when suddenly he stopped and dragged me down among some gorse bushes which lined the path his tug at my coat was so strenuous and imperative that i realized that the danger was a pressing one and in an instant i was squatting down beside him as still as the bushes which shadowed us it was so dark there that i could not even see the lad beside me it was a warm night and a hot wind puffed in our faces suddenly in this wind there came something homely and familiar the smell of burning tobacco and then a face illuminated by the glowing bowl of a pipe came floating towards us the man was all in shadow but just that one dim halo of light with the face which filled it brighter below and shading away into darkness above stood out against the universal blackness a thin hungry face thickly freckled with yellow over the cheekbones blue watery eyes an ill-nourished light-coloured moustache a peaked yachting cap that was all that i saw he passed us looking vacantly in front of him and we heard the steps dying away along the path who was it i asked as we rose to our feet i don't know the fellow's continual profession of ignorance made me angry 
"'Why should you hide yourself, then?' I asked sharply. "'Because Maester Maple told me. He said that I were to meet no one. If I met any one, I should get no pay.' "'You met that sailor on the road?' "'Yes, and I think he was one of them.' "'One of whom?' "'One of the folk that have come on the fells. They are watching Greta House, and Maester Maple is afeard of them. That's why he wanted us to keep clear of them, and that's why I've been a-trying to dodge em. Here was something definite at last. Some body of men were threatening my uncle. The sailor was one of them. The man with the peaked cap, probably a sailor also, was another. I bethought me of Stepney Highway and of the murderous assault made upon my uncle there. Things were fitting themselves into a connected shape in my mind when a light twinkled over the fell, and my guide informed me that it was Greta. The place lay in a dip among the moors, so that one was very near it before one saw it. A short walk brought us up to the door. I could see little of the building, save that the lamp which shone through a small latticed window showed me dimly that it was both long and lofty. The low door, under an overhanging lintel, was loosely fitted, and light was bursting out on each side of it. The inmates of this lonely house appeared to be keenly on their guard, for they had heard our footsteps, and we were challenged before we reached the door. "'Who is there?' cried a deep, booming voice, and urgently, "'Who is it, I say?' "'It's me, Maester Maple. I have brought the gentleman.' There was a sharp click, and a small wooden shutter flew open in the door. The gleam of a lantern shone upon us for a few seconds, then the shutter closed again, and with a great rasping of locks and clattering of bars the door was opened, and I saw my uncle standing framed in that vivid yellow square cut out of the darkness. He was a small, thick man, with a great rounded bald head and one thin border of gingery curls. It was a fine head, the head of a thinker, but his large white face was heavy and commonplace, with a broad loose-lipped mouth and two hanging dewlaps on either side of it. His eyes were small and restless, and his light-colored lashes were continually moving. My mother had said once that they reminded her of the legs of a woodlouse, and I saw at the first glance what she meant. I heard also that in Stepney he had learned the language of his customers, and I blushed for our kinship as I listened to his villainous accent. "'So, nephew,' said he, holding out his hand, "'come in, come in, man, quick, and don't leave the door open. Your mother said you were grown a big lad, and my word she is right to say so. Here's a half-crown for you, William, and you can go back again. Put the things down. Here, Enoch, take Mr. John's things, and see that his supper is on the table.' As my uncle, after fastening the door, turned to show me into the sitting-room, I became aware of his most striking peculiarity. The injuries which he had received some years ago had, as I have already remarked, left one leg several inches shorter than the other. To atone for this he wore one of those enormous wooden soles to his boots which are prescribed by surgeons in such cases. He walked without a limp, but his tread on the stone flooring made a curious clack-click, clack-click, as the wood and the leather alternated. Whenever he moved, it was to the rhythm of this singular castanet. The great kitchen, with its huge fireplace and carved settle corners, showed that this dwelling was an old-time farmhouse. On one side of the room a line of boxes stood, all corded and packed, the furniture was scant and plain, but on a trestle table in the centre some supper, cold meat, bread, and a jug of beer, was laid for me. An elderly manservant, as manifest a cockney as his master, waited upon me, while my uncle, sitting in a corner, asked me many questions as to my mother and myself. When my meal was finished, he ordered his man Enoch to unpack my gun. I observed that two other guns, old rusted weapons, were leaning against the wall beside the window. "'It's the window I'm afraid of,' said my uncle, in the deep reverberant voice which contrasted oddly with his plump little figure. "'The door's safe against anything short of dynamite, but the window's a terror. Aye, he yelled, "'don't walk across the light. You can duck when you pass the lattice.' "'For fear of being seen?' I asked. For fear of being shot, my lad, that's the trouble. Now come and sit beside me on the trestle here, and I'll tell you all about it, for I can see that you are the right sort and can be trusted. 
his flattery was clumsy and halting and it was evident that he was very eager to conciliate me i sat down beside him and he drew a folded paper from his pocket it was a western morning news and the date was ten days before the passage over which he pressed a long black nail was concerned with the release from dartmoor of a convict named elias whose term of sentence had been remitted on account of his defence of a warder who had been attacked in the quarries the whole account was only a few lines long who is he then i asked my uncle cocked his distorted foot into the air that's his mark said he he was doing time for that now he's out and after me again but why should he be after you because he wants to kill me because he'll never rest the worrying devil till he has had his revenge on me it's this way nephew i've got no secrets from you he thinks i've wronged him for argument's sake we'll suppose i have wronged him and now him and his friends are after me who are his friends my uncle's boom sank suddenly to a frightened whisper sailors said he i knew they would come when i saw that ear paper and two days ago i looked through that window and three of them was standing looking at the house it was after that that i wrote to your mother they marked me down and they're waiting for him but why not send for the police my uncle's eyes avoided mine police are no use said he it's you that can help me what can i do i'll tell you i'm going to move that's what all these boxes are for everything will soon be packed and ready i have friends at leeds and i shall be safer there not safe mind you but safer i start to-morrow evening and if you will stand by me until then i will make it worth your while there's only enoch and me to do everything but we shall have it all ready i promise you by to-morrow evening the cart will be round then and you and me and enoch and the boy william can guard the things as far as congleton station did you see anything of them on the fells yes said i a sailor stopped us on the way i knew they were watching us that's why i asked you to get out at the wrong station and to drive to purcell's instead of coming here we are blockaded that's the word and there was another said i a man with a pipe what was he like thin face freckles a peak my uncle gave a hoarse scream at him at him he come god be merciful to me a sinner he went click-clacking about the room with his great foot like one distracted there was something piteous and baby-like in that big bald head and for the first time i felt a gush of pity for him come uncle said i you are living in a civilized land there is a law that will bring these gentry to order let me drive over to the county police station to-morrow morning and i'll soon set things right but he shook his head at me he cunning and he's cruel said he i can't draw a breath without thinking of him cos he buckled up three of my ribs he'll kill me this time sure there's only one chance we must leave what we have not packed and we must be off first thing to-morrow morning good god what's that a tremendous knock upon the door had reverberated through the house and then another and another an iron fist seemed to be beating upon it my uncle collapsed into his chair i seized a gun and ran to the door who's there i shouted there was no answer i opened the shutter and looked out no one was there and then suddenly i saw that a long slip of paper was protruding through the slit of the door i held it to the light in rude but vigorous handwriting the message ran put them out on the doorstep and save your skin what do they want i asked as i read in the message what they'll never have no nah, by the lord never he cried with a fine burst of spirit here enoch enoch the old fellow came running to the call enoch i've been a good master to you all my life and it's your turn now will you take a risk for me i thought better of my uncle when i saw how readily the man consented whomever else he had wronged this one at least seemed to love him put your cloak on and your hat enoch and out with you by the back door you know the way across the moor to the purcell tell em that i must ab the cart first thing in the morning and that purcell must come with the shepherd as well we must get clear of this or we are done first thing in the morning enoch and ten pound for the job keep the black cloak on and move slow and they will never see you we'll keep the house till you come back 
it was a job for a brave man to venture out into the vague and invisible dangers of the fell but the old servant took it as the most ordinary of messages picking his long black cloak and his soft hat from the hook behind the door he was ready on the instant we extinguished the small lamp in the back passage softly unbarred the back door slipped him out and barred it up again looking through the small hall window i saw his black garments merge instantly into the night it is but a few hours before the light comes nephew said my uncle after he had tried all the bolts and bars you shall never regret this night's work if we come through safely it will be the making of you stand by me till morning and i stand by you while there's breath in my body the cart will be here by five what isn't ready we can't afford to leave behind we've only to load up and make for the early train at congleton will they let us pass in broad daylight they dare not stop us there will be six of us if they all come and three guns we can fight our way through where can they get guns common wandering seamen a pistol or two at the most if we can keep them out for a few hours we are safe enoch must be halfway to purcell's by now but what do these sailors want i repeated you say yourself that you wronged them a look of mulish obstinacy came over his large white face don't ask questions nephew and just do what i ask you said he enoch won't come back he'll just hide there and come with the cart ark what is that a distant cry rang from out of the darkness and then another one short and sharp like the wail of the curlew it's enoch said my uncle gripping my arm kill him poor old enoch the cry came again much nearer and i heard the sound of hurrying steps and a shrill call for help they're after him cried my uncle rushing to the front door he picked up the lantern and flashed it through the little shutter up the yellow funnel of light a man was running frantically his head bowed and a black cloak fluttering behind him the moor seemed to be alive with dim pursuers the bolt the bolt gasped my uncle he pushed it back whilst i turned the key and we swung the door open to admit the fugitive he dashed in and turned at once with a long yell of triumph come on lads tumble up all oh, hands tumble up smartly there all of you it was so quickly and neatly done that we were taken by storm before we knew that we were attacked the passage was full of rushing sailors i slipped out of the clutch of one and ran for my gun but it was only to crash down onto the stone floor an instant later with two of them holding on to me they were so deft and quick that my hands were lashed together even while i struggled and i was dragged into the settle corner unhurt but very sore in spirit at the cunning with which our defences had been forced and the ease with which we had been overcome they had not even troubled to bind my uncle but he had been pushed into his chair and the guns had been taken away he sat with a very white face his homely figure and absurd row of curls looking curiously out of place among the wild figures who surrounded him there were six of them all evidently sailors one i recognized as the man with the earrings whom i had already met upon the road that evening they were all fine weather bronzed bewhiskered fellows in the midst of them leaning against the table was the freckled man who had passed me on the moor the great black cloak which poor enoch had taken out with him was still hanging from his shoulders he was of a very different type from the others crafty cruel dangerous with sly thoughtful eyes which gloated over my uncle they suddenly turned themselves upon me and i never knew how one's skin can creep at a man's glance before who are you he asked speak out or we will find a way to make you i am mr stephen maple's nephew come to visit him you are are you well i wish you joy of your uncle and of your visit too quick's the word lads for we must be aboard before morning what shall we do with the old un trice him up yankee fashion and give him six dozen said one of the seamen do you hear you cursed cockney thief we'll beat the life out of you if you don't give back what you've stolen where are they i know you never parted with them my uncle pursed up his lips and shook his head with a face in which his fear and his obstinacy contended won't tell won't you we'll see about that get him ready jim one of the seamen seized my uncle and pulled his coat and shirt over his shoulders 
he sat lumped in his chair his body all creased into white rolls which shivered with cold and with terror up with them to those hooks there were rows of them along the walls where the smoked meat used to be hung the seamen tied my uncle by the wrist to two of these then one of them undid his leather belt the buckle end jim said the captain give him the buckle you cowards i cried to beat an old man we'll beat a young one next said he with a malevolent glance at my corner now jim cut a wad out of him give him one more chance cried one of the seamen ay ay growled one or two others give the swab a chance if you turn soft you may give him up forever said the captain one thing or the other you must lash it out of him or you will give up what you took much pains to win and what would make you gentlemen for life every one of you there's nothing else for it what shall it be let him have it they cried savagely then stand clear the buckle of the man's belt whined savagely as he whirled it over his shoulder but my uncle cried out before the blow fell i can't stand it he cried let me down where are they then i'll show you if you'll let me down they cast off the handkerchiefs and he pulled his coat over his fat round shoulders the seamen stood round him the most intense curiosity and excitement upon their swarthy faces no gammon cried the man with the freckles we'll kill you joint by joint if you try to fool us now then where are they in my bedroom where is that the room above whereabouts in the corner of the oak arc by the bed the seamen all rushed to the stair but the captain called them back we don't leave this cunning old fox behind us ha ah, your face drops at that does it by the lord i believe you are trying to slip your anchor here lads make him fast and take him along with a confused trampling of feet they rushed up the stairs dragging my uncle in the midst of them for an instant i was alone my hands were tied but not my feet if i could find my way across the moor i might rouse the police and intercept these rascals before they could reach the sea for a moment i hesitated as to whether i should leave my uncle alone in such a plight but i should be of more service to him or at the worst to his property if i went than if i stayed i rushed to the hall door and as i reached it i heard a yell above my head a shattering splintering noise and then amid a chorus of shouts a huge weight fell with a horrible thud at my very feet never while i live will that squelching thud pass out of my ears and there just in front of me in the lane of light cast by the open door lay my unhappy uncle his bald head twisted on to one shoulder like the wrung neck of a chicken it needed but a glance to see that his spine was broken and that he was dead the gang of seamen had rushed downstairs so quickly that they were clustered at the door and crowding all round me almost as soon as i had realized what had occurred it's no doing it ours mate said one of them to me he hove himself through the window and that's the truth don't you put it down to us he thought he could get to windward of us if once he was out in the dark you see said another but he came head foremost and broke his bloomin neck and a blessed good job too cried the chief with a savage oath i'd have done it for him if he hadn't took the lead don't make any mistake my lads this is murder and we're all in it together there's only one way out of it and that is to hang together unless as the saying goes you mean to hang apart there's only one witness he looked at me with his malicious little eyes and i saw that he had something that gleamed either a knife or a revolver in the breast of his pea-jacket two of the men slipped between us so that captain elias said one of them if this old man met his end it is through no fault of ours the worst we ever meant him was to take some of the skin off his back but as to this young fellow we have no quarrel with him you fool you may have no quarrel with him but he has his quarrel with you he'll swear your life away if you don't silence his tongue it's his life or ours and don't you make any mistake ay ay the skipper has the longest head of any of us better do what he tells you cried another but my champion who was the fellow with the earrings covered me with his own broad chest and swore roundly that no one should lay a finger on me the others were equally divided and my fate might have been the cause of a quarrel between them when suddenly the captain gave a cry of delight and amazement which was taken up by the whole gang i followed their eyes and outstretched fingers and this was what i saw my uncle was lying with his legs outstretched 
and the club foot was that which was furthest from us. All round this foot a dozen brilliant objects were twinkling and flashing in the yellow light which streamed from the open door. The captain caught up the lantern and held it to the place. The huge sole of his boot had been shattered in the fall, and it was clear now that it had been a hollow box in which he stowed his valuables, for the path was all sprinkled with precious stones. Three which I saw were of an unusual size, and as many as forty, I should think, of fair value. The seamen had cast themselves down and were greedily gathering them up, when my friend with the earrings plucked me by the sleeve. "'Here's your chance, mate,' he whispered. "'Off you go before worse comes of it.' It was a timely hint, and it did not take me long to act upon it. A few cautious steps, and I had passed unobserved beyond the circle of light. Then I set off running, falling and rising and falling again, for no one who has not tried it can tell how hard it is to run over uneven ground with hands which are fastened together. I ran and ran, until, for want of breath, I could no longer put one foot before the other. But I need not have hurried so, for when I had gone a long way I stopped at last to breathe, and looking back I could see the gleam of the lantern far away, and the outline of the seaman who squatted around it. Then at last the single point of light went suddenly out, and the whole great moor was left in the thickest darkness. So deftly was I tied that it took me a long half-hour and a broken tooth before I got my hands free. My idea was to make my way across to the Purcell's farm, but north was the same as south under that pitchy sky, and for hours I wandered among the rustling, scuttling sheep without any certainty as to where I was going. When at last there came a glimmer in the east and the undulating fells, gray with the morning mist, rolled once more to the horizon, I recognized that I was close by Purcell's farm, and there, a little in front of me, I was startled to see another man walking in the same direction. At first I approached him warily, but before I overtook him I knew by the bent back and tottering step that it was Enoch, the old servant, and right glad I was to see that he was living. He had been knocked down, beaten, and his cloak and hat taken away by these ruffians, and all night he had wandered in the darkness, like myself, in search of help. He burst into tears when I told him of his master's death, and sat hiccuping with the hard dry sobs of an old man among the stones upon the moor. "'It's the men of the Black Mogul,' he said. "'Yes, yes, I knew that they would be the N.A.M. "'Who are they?' I asked. "'Well, well, you are one of his own folks,' said he. "'He has passed away. Yes, yes, it is all over and done. I can tell you about it, no man better, but mum's the word with old Enoch unless master wants him to speak. But his own nephew, who come to help him in hour of need. Yes, yes, Mr. John, you ought to know. It was like this, sir. Your uncle had his grocer's business at Stepney, but he had another business also. He would buy as well as sell, and when he bought, he never asked no questions where the stuff came from. Why should he? It wasn't no business of his, was it? If folk bought him a stone or a silver plate, what was it to him where they got it? That's good sense, and it ought to be good law, as I old. Anyhow, it was good enough for us at Stepney. Well, there was a steamer come from South Africa what foundered at sea. At least they say so, and Lloyd's paid the money. She had some very fine diamonds and voiced as being aboard of her. Soon after there came the brig Black Mogul into the port of London with her papers all right as having cleared from Port Elizabeth with a cargo of hides. The captain, which his name was Elias, he came to see the master, and what do you think that he had to sell? Why, sir, as I'm living sinner, he had a packet of diamonds for all the world just the same as what was lost out of that there African steamer. How did he get em? I don't know. Master didn't know. He didn't seek to know, either. The captain, he was anxious for reason of his own to get em safe, so he gave em to master, same as you might put a thing in the bank. But master, he'd had time to get fond of him, and wasn't over satisfied as to where the black mogul had been trading or where her captain had got the stones. So when he comes back for them, the master, he said, as he thought they were best of his own hands, mind, I don't hold with it myself, but that was what master said to Captain Elias in the little black parlor at Stepney. That was how he got his leg broke and three of his ribs. 
So the captain got jugged for that, and the master, when he was able to get about, thought that he would have peace for fifteen years, and he came away from London because he was afraid of the sailormen. But at the end of five years the captain was out and after him with as many of his crew as he could gather. Send for the police, you says? Why, there were two sides to that, and the master, he wasn't much more fond of the police than Elias was. But they fair enmeshed master in, as you have seen for yourself, and they bested him at last, and the loneliness that he thought would be his safety is proved his ruin. Well, well, he was hard to many, but a good master to me, and it's long before I come on such another. One word in conclusion. A strange cutter, which had been hanging about the coast, was seen to beat down the Irish Sea that morning, and it is conjectured that Elias and his men were on board of it. At any rate, nothing has been heard of them since. It was shown at the inquest that my uncle had lived in a sordid fashion for years, and he left little behind him. The mere knowledge that he possessed this treasure, which he carried about with him in so extraordinary a fashion, had appeared to be the joy of his life, and he had never, as far as we could learn, tried to realize any of his diamonds. So his disreputable name, when living, was not atoned for by any posthumous benevolence, and the family, equally scandalized by his life and by his death, have finally buried all memory of the club-footed grocer of Stepney. End of Story 10 Story 11 of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 11 The Sealed Room. A solicitor of an active habit and athletic tastes who is compelled by his hopes of business to remain within the four walls of his office from ten till five must take what exercise he can in the evenings. Hence it was that I was in the habit of indulging in very long nocturnal excursions in which I sought the heights of Hampstead and Highgate in order to cleanse my system from the impure air of Abchurch Lane. It was in the course of one of these aimless rambles that I first met Felix Staniford, and so led up to what has been the most extraordinary adventure of my lifetime. One evening, it was in April or early May of the year 1894, I made my way to the extreme northern fringe of London, and was walking down one of those fine avenues of high brick villas which the huge city is forever pushing farther and farther out into the country. It was a fine clear spring night, the moon was shining out of an unclouded sky, and I, having already left many miles behind me, was inclined to walk slowly and look about me. In this contemplative mood my attention was arrested by one of the houses which I was passing. It was a very large building, standing in its own grounds, a little back from the road. It was modern in appearance, and yet it was far less so than its neighbors, all of which were crudely and painfully new. Their symmetrical line was broken by the gap caused by the laurel-studded lawn, with the great dark gloomy house looming at the back of it. Evidently it had been the country retreat of some wealthy merchant, built perhaps when the nearest street was a mile off, and now gradually overtaken and surrounded by the red brick tentacles of the London octopus. The next stage, I reflected, would be its digestion and absorption, so that the cheap builder might rear a dozen eighty-pound-a-year villas upon the garden frontage. And then, as all this passed vaguely through my mind, an incident occurred which brought my thoughts into quite another channel. A four-wheeled cab, that opprobrium of London, was coming jolting and creaking in one direction, while in the other there was a yellow glare from the lamp of a cyclist. They were the only moving objects in the whole long, moonlit road, and yet they crashed into each other with that malignant accuracy which brings two ocean liners together in the broad waste of the Atlantic. It was the cyclist's fault. He tried to cross in front of the cab, miscalculated his distance, and was knocked sprawling by the horse's shoulder. He rose, snarling, the cabman swore back at him, and then realizing that his number had not yet been taken, lashed his horse and lumbered off. The cyclist caught at the handles of his prostrate machine, and then suddenly sat down with a groan. "'Oh, 
lord he said i ran across the road to his side any harm done i asked it's my ankle said he only a twist i think but it's pretty painful just give me your hand will you he lay in the yellow circle of the cycle lamp and i noted as i helped him to his feet that he was a gentlemanly young fellow with a slight dark moustache and large brown eyes sensitive and nervous in appearance with indications of weak health upon his sunken cheeks work or worry had left its traces upon his thin yellow face he stood up when i pulled his hand but he held one foot in the air and he groaned as he moved it i can't put it on the ground said he where do you live here he nodded his head towards the big dark house in the garden i was cutting across to the gate when that confounded cab ran into me could you help me so far it was easily done i put his cycle inside the gate and then i supported him down the drive and up the steps to the hall door there was not a light anywhere and the place was as black and silent as if no one had ever lived in it that will do thank you very much said he fumbling with his key in the lock no you must allow me to see you safe he made some feeble petulant protest and then realized that he could really do nothing without me the door had opened into a pitch-dark hall he lurched forward with my hand still on his arm this door to the right said he feeling about in the darkness i opened the door and at the same moment he managed to strike a light there was a lamp upon the table and we lit it between us now i'm all right you can leave me now good-bye said he and with the words he sat down in the armchair and fainted dead away it was a queer position for me the fellow looked so ghastly that really i was not sure that he was not dead presently his lips quivered and his breast heaved but his eyes were two white slits and his color was horrible the responsibility was more than i could stand i pulled at the bell rope and heard the bell ringing furiously far away but no one came in response the bell tinkled away into silence which no murmur or movement came to break i waited and rang again with the same result there must be someone about the young gentleman could not live all alone in that huge house his people ought to know of his condition if they would not answer the bell i must hunt them out myself i seized the lamp and rushed from the room what i saw outside amazed me the hall was empty the stairs were bare and yellow with dust there were three doors opening into spacious rooms and each was uncarpeted and undraped save for the grey webs which drooped from the cornice and rosettes of lichen which had formed upon the walls my feet reverberated in those empty and silent chambers then i wandered on down the passage with the idea that the kitchens at least might be tenanted some caretaker might lurk in some secluded room no they were all equally desolate despairing of finding any help i ran down another corridor and came on something which surprised me more than ever the passage ended in a large brown door and the door had a seal of red wax the size of a five shilling piece over the keyhole this seal gave me the impression of having been there for a long time for it was dusty and discolored i was still staring at it and wondering what that door might conceal when i heard a voice calling behind me and running back found my young man sitting up in his chair and very much astonished at finding himself in darkness why on earth did you take the lamp away he asked i was looking for assistance well you might look for some time said he i am alone in the house awkward if you get an illness it was foolish of me to faint i inherit a weak heart from my mother and pain or emotion has that effect upon me it will carry me off some day as it did her you're not a doctor are you no a lawyer frank alder is my name mine is felix staniford funny that i should meet a lawyer for my friend mr percival was saying that we should need one soon very happy i am sure well that will depend upon him you know did you say that you had run with that lamp all over the ground floor yes all over it he asked with emphasis and he looked at me very hard i think so i kept on hoping that i should find someone did you enter all the rooms he asked with the same intent gaze well all that i could enter 
"'Oh, then you did notice it,' said he, and he shrugged his shoulders with the air of a man who makes the best of a bad job. "'Notice what? Why, the door with the seal on it. Yes, I did. Weren't you curious to know what was in it? Well, it did strike me as unusual. Do you think you could go on living alone in this house year after year, just longing all the time to know what is at the other side of that door, and yet not looking?' do you mean to say i cried that you don't know yourself no more than you do then why don't you look i mustn't said he he spoke in a constrained way and i saw that i had blundered on to some delicate ground i don't know that i am more inquisitive than my neighbours but there certainly was something in the situation which appealed very strongly to my curiosity however my last excuse for remaining in the house was gone now that my companion had recovered his senses i rose to go are you in a hurry he asked well, no i have nothing to do well i should be very glad if you would stay with me a little the fact is that i live a very retired and secluded life here i don't suppose there is a man in london who leads such a life as i do it is quite unusual for me to have any one to talk with I looked round at the little room, scantily furnished, with a sofa-bed at one side. Then I thought of the great bare house and the sinister door, with the discoloured red seal upon it. There was something queer and grotesque in the situation, which made me long to know a little more. Perhaps I should, if I waited. I told him that I should be very happy. You will find the spirits and a siphon upon the side-table. You must forgive me if I cannot act as host but I can't get across the room. Those are cigars in the tray there. I'll take one myself, I think. And so you are a solicitor, Mr. Alder? Yes. And I am nothing. I am that most helpless of living creatures, the son of a millionaire. I was brought up with the expectation of great wealth, and here I am, a poor man, without any profession at all. And then, on top of it all, I am left with this great mansion on my hands, which I cannot possibly keep up. Isn't it an absurd situation? For me to use this as my dwelling is like a coster drawing his barrow with a thoroughbred. A donkey would be more useful to him and a cottage to me. But why not sell the house? I asked. I mustn't. Let it, then. No, I mustn't do that, either i looked puzzled and my companion smiled i'll tell you how it is if it won't bore you said he on the contrary i should be exceedingly interested i think after your kind attention to me i cannot do less than relieve any curiosity that you may feel you must know that my father was stanislaus staniford the banker staniford the banker i remembered the name at once his flight from the country some seven years before had been one of the scandals and sensations of the time i see that you remember said my companion my poor father left the country to avoid numerous friends whose savings he had invested in an unsuccessful speculation he was a nervous sensitive man and the responsibility quite upset his reason he had committed no legal offence it was purely a matter of sentiment he would not even face his own family and he died among strangers without ever letting us know where he was he died said i we could not prove his death but we know that it must be so because the speculations came right again and so there was no reason why he should not look any man in the face he would have returned if he were alive but he must have died in the last two years why in the last two years because we heard from him two years ago did he not tell you then where he was living the letter came from paris but no address was given it was when my poor mother died he wrote to me then with some instructions and some advice and i never heard from him again had you heard before oh yes we had heard before and that's where our mystery of the sealed door upon which you stumbled to-night has its origin pass me that desk if you please here i have my father's letters and you are the first man except mr percival who has seen them who is mr percival may i ask he was my father's confidential clerk and he has continued to be the friend and adviser of my mother and then of myself i don't know what we should have done without percival he saw the letters but no one else 
This is the first one, which came on the very day when my father fled seven years ago. Read it to yourself. This is the letter which I read. My ever dearest wife, since Sir William told me how weak your heart is and how harmful any shock might be, I have never talked about my business affairs to you. The time has come when at all risks I can no longer refrain from telling you that things have been going badly with me. This will cause me to leave you for a little while, but it is with the absolute assurance that we shall see each other very soon. On this you can thoroughly rely. Our parting is only for a very short time, my own darling, so don't let it fret you, and above all, don't let it impair your health, for that is what I want above all things to avoid. Now I have a request to make, and I implore you by all that binds us together to fulfill it exactly as I tell you. There are some things which I do not wish to be seen by any one in my dark room, the room which I use for photographic purposes at the end of the garden passage. To prevent any painful thoughts, I may assure you once for all, dear, that it is nothing of which I need be ashamed, but still I do not wish you or Felix to enter that room. It is locked, and I implore you when you receive this to at once place a seal over the lock and leave it so. Do not sell or let the house, for in either case my secret will be discovered. As long as you or Felix are in the house, I know that you will comply with my wishes. When Felix is twenty-one, he may enter the room, not before. And now, good-bye, my own best of wives. During our short separation, you can consult Mr. Percival on any matters which may arise. He has my complete confidence. I hate to leave Felix and you, even for a time, but there is really no choice." Ever and always your loving husband, Stanislaw Staniford, June 4th, 1887. These are very private family matters for me to inflict upon you, said my companion apologetically. You must look upon it as done in your professional capacity. I have wanted to speak about it for years. Well, I'm honored by your confidence, I answered, and exceedingly interested by the facts. My father was a man who was noted for his almost morbid love of truth. He was always pedantically accurate. When he said, therefore, that he hoped to see my mother very soon, and when he said that he had nothing to be ashamed of in the dark room, you may rely upon it that he meant it. Then what can it be? I ejaculated. Neither my mother nor I could imagine. We carried out his wishes to the letter and placed the seal upon the door. There it has been ever since. My mother lived for five years after my father's disappearance, although at the time all the doctors said that she could not survive long. Her heart was terribly diseased. During the first few months she had two letters from my father. Both had the Paris postmark, but no address. They were short and to the same effect, that they would soon be reunited, and that she should not fret. Then there was a silence which lasted until her death and then came a letter to me of so private a nature that I cannot show it to you, begging me never to think evil of him, giving me much good advice, and saying that the sealing of the room was of less importance now than during the lifetime of my mother, but that the opening might still cause pain to others, and that, therefore, he thought it best that it should be postponed until my twenty-first year, for the lapse of time would make things easier." In the meantime, he committed the care of the room to me, so now you can understand how it is that although I am a very poor man, I can neither let nor sell this great house. You could mortgage it. My father had already done so. It is a most singular state of affairs. My mother and I were gradually compelled to sell the furniture and to dismiss the servants, until now, as you see, I am living unattended in a single room but I have only two more months. What do you mean? Why, that in two months I come of age. The first thing that I do will be to open that door, the second to get rid of the house. Why should your father have continued to stay away when these investments had recovered themselves? He must be dead. You say that he had not committed any legal offense when he fled the country? None. Why should he not take your mother with him? I do not know. Why should he conceal his address? I do not know. Why should he allow your mother to die and be buried without coming back? I do not know. 
my dear sir said i if i may speak with the frankness of a professional adviser i should say that it is very clear that your father had the strongest reasons for keeping out of the country and that if nothing has been proved against him he at least thought that something might be and refused to put himself within the power of the law surely that must be obvious for in what other possible way can the facts be explained my companion did not take my suggestion in good part you had not the advantage of knowing my father mr alder he said coldly i was only a boy when he left us but i shall always look upon him as my ideal man his only fault was that he was too sensitive and too unselfish that any one should lose money through him would cut him to the heart his sense of honour was most acute and any theory of his disappearance which conflicts with that is a mistaken one it pleased me to hear the lad speak out so roundly and yet i knew that the facts were against him and that he was incapable of taking an unprejudiced view of the situation i only speak as an outsider said i and now i must leave you for i have a long walk before me your story has interested me so much that i should be glad if you could let me know the sequel leave me your card said he and so having bade him good night i left him i heard nothing more of the matter for some time and had almost feared that it would prove to be one of those fleeting experiences which drift away from our direct observation and end only in a hope or a suspicion one afternoon however a card bearing the name of mr j h percival was brought up to my office in abchurch lane and its bearer a small dry bright-eyed fellow of fifty was ushered in by the clerk i believe sir said he that my name has been mentioned to you by my young friend mr felix staniford of course i answered i remember he spoke to you i understand about the circumstances in connection with the disappearance of my former employer mr stanislaus staniford and the existence of a sealed room in his former residence he did and you expressed an interest in the matter it interested me extremely you are aware that we hold mr staniford's permission to open the door on the twenty-first birthday of his son i remember the twenty-first birthday is to-day have you opened it i asked eagerly not yet sir said he gravely i have reason to believe that it would be well to have witnesses present when that door is open you are a lawyer and you are acquainted with the facts will you be present on the occasion most certainly you are employed during the day and so am i shall we meet at nine o'clock at the house i will come with pleasure then you will find us waiting for you good-bye for the present he bowed solemnly and took his leave i kept my appointment that evening with a brain which was weary with fruitless attempts to think out some plausible explanation of the mystery which we were about to solve mr percival and my young acquaintance were waiting for me in the little room i was not surprised to see the young man looking pale and nervous but i was rather astonished to find the dry little city man in a state of intense though partially suppressed excitement his cheeks were flushed his hands twitching and he could not stand still for an instant staniford greeted me warmly and thanked me many times for having come and now percival said he to his companion i suppose there is no obstacle to our putting the thing through without delay i shall be glad to get it over the banker's clerk took up the lamp and led the way but he paused in the passage outside the door and his hand was shaking so that the light flickered up and down the high bare walls mr staniford said he in a cracking voice i hope you will prepare yourself in case any shock should be waiting you when that seal is removed and the door is opened what could there be percival you are trying to frighten me no mr staniford but i should wish you to be ready to be braced up not to allow yourself he had to lick his dry lips between every jerky sentence and i suddenly realized as clearly as if he had told me that he knew what was behind that closed door and that it was something terrible here are the keys mr staniford but remember my warning he had a bunch of assorted keys in his hand and the young man snatched them from him then he thrust a knife under the discolored red seal and jerked it off 
the lamp was rattling and shaking in percival's hands so i took it from him and held it near the keyhole while staniford tried key after key at last one turned in the lock the door flew open he took one step into the room and then with a horrible cry the young man fell senseless at our feet if i had not given heed to the clerk's warning and braced myself for a shock i should certainly have dropped the lamp the room windowless and bare was fitted up as a photographic laboratory with a tap and sink at the far side of it a shelf of bottles and measures stood at one side and a peculiar heavy smell partly chemical partly animal filled the air a single table and chair were in front of us and at this with his back turned towards us a man was seated in the act of writing his outline and attitude were as natural as life but as the light fell upon him it made my hair rise to see that the nape of his neck was black and wrinkled and no thicker than my wrist dust lay upon him thick yellow dust upon his hair his shoulders his shriveled lemon-coloured hands his head had fallen forward upon his breast his pen still rested upon a discoloured sheet of paper my poor master my poor poor master cried the clerk and the tears were running down his cheeks what i cried mr stanislaus staniford here he has sat for seven years oh why should he do it i begged him i implored him i went on my knees to him but he would have his way you see the key on the table he had locked the door upon the inside and he has written something we must take it yes yes take it and for god's sake let us get out of this i cried the air is poisonous come staniford come taking an arm each we half led and half carried the terrified man back to his own room it was my father he cried as he recovered his consciousness he is sitting there dead in his chair you knew it percival this was what you meant when you warned me yes i knew it mr staniford i have acted for the best all along but my position has been a terribly difficult one for seven years i have known that your father was dead in that room you knew it and never told us don't be harsh with me mr staniford sir make allowance for a man who has had a hard part to play my head is swimming round i cannot grasp it he staggered up and helped himself from the brandy bottle these letters to my mother and to myself were, were they forgeries no sir your father wrote them and addressed them and left them in my keeping to be posted i have followed his instructions to the very letter in all things he was my master and i have obeyed him the brandy had steadied the young man's shaken nerves tell me about it i can stand it now said he well mr staniford you know that at one time there came a period of great trouble upon your father and he thought that many poor people were about to lose their savings through his fault he was a man who was so tender-hearted that he could not bear the thought it worried him and tormented him until he determined to end his life oh mr staniford if you knew how i have prayed him and wrestled with him over it you would never blame me and in turn prayed me as no man has ever prayed me before he had made up his mind and he would do it in any case he said but it rested with me whether his death should be happy and easy or whether it should be most miserable i read in his eyes that he meant what he said and at last i yielded to his prayers and i consented to do his will what was troubling him was this he had been told by the first doctor in london that his wife's heart would fail at the slightest shock he had a horror of accelerating her end and yet his own existence had become unendurable to him how could he end himself without injuring her you know now the course that he took he wrote the letter which she received there was nothing in it which was not literally true when he spoke of seeing her again so soon he was referring to her own approaching death which he had been assured could not be delayed more than a very few months so convinced was he of this that he only left two letters to be forwarded at intervals after his death she lived five years and i had no letters to send he left another letter with me to be sent to you sir upon the occasion of the death of your mother i posted all these in paris to sustain the idea of his being abroad 
it was his wish that i should say nothing and i have said nothing i have been a faithful servant seven years after his death he thought no doubt that the shock to the feelings of his surviving friends would be lessened he was always considerate for others there was silence for some time it was broken by young staniford i cannot blame you percival you have spared my mother a shock which would certainly have broken her heart what is that paper it is what your father was writing sir shall i read it to you do so i have taken the poison and i feel it working in my veins it is strange but not painful when these words are read i shall if my wishes have been faithfully carried out have been dead many years surely no one who has lost money through me will bear me animosity and you felix you will forgive me this family scandal may god find rest for a sorely wearied spirit amen we cried all three end of story eleven